You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not kill, but whoever murders will be held liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you are angry with your brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult your brother or sister, you're liable to the court. And if you say you fool, you're liable to the hell of fire. When offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that you have a, a, a sin against your brother or sister, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled with your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while on your way to court or your accuser will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be thrown into prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with less has already committed adultery with her in, her heart, in, her, in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever would divorce his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever, gives, whoever divorces his wife, except for on the grounds of unfaithfulness, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries an unfaithful woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, which is the throne of God, or the earth, which is his footstool, or Jerusalem, which is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your own head, because you can't make one hair white or black. Rather, let your word yes be yes or no, no. Anything other than this is from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father who got you up this morning and started you on your way. Can I have an amen? amen? And from Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, the son of Joseph, the son of David, the son of man, the son of God, his friends betrayed him. Uh, the Romans tried to kill him. Satan tempted him, but yet he still lives and lives in our lives. Can I have an amen? Amen. And from the Holy Spirit, and I'm not talking about any old Holy Spirit here, I'm talking about the Holy Spirit who comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. The HG is in the house, can I have an amen? amen. Okay, relax, I'm Lutheran, okay? <laughs> I want to start by asking you a very important question. How many people here in the room are Christian? Alright, good, I kind of assume that. Now, and there are children in the room watching. This question is going to get a little more personal. How many of you have ever lusted? Yeah, and most of you are lying right now. <laughs> so here's the deal. If you're a Christian and you've lusted, how come all of you have both your eyes and you have both your hands? I mean, didn't you just hear the text? If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, throw it away. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Really, the sign of a Christian might be one-eyedness. Now, I've got to tell you a little story about this text, because this is a really important text, but generally gets misunderstood. A number of years ago, I was uh, speaking to a group of senior high kids, about 1,200 senior high kids in a, in a uh, uh, hotel conference room, and I was speaking to them and going through the Sermon on the Mount, just reciting it for them. And their challenge was this. They had to... Uh, Listen to the Sermon on the Mount, and we gave them three by five cards. And afterwards, all they had to do was write down any questions that might come to mind based upon hearing on the Sermon on the Mount, because it's weird language. And, you know, it's not kind of a language that they might understand. Here's the deal. Got 1,200 cards. I'm back in my hotel room sorting all this out, because the next morning we're going to unpack all this stuff, see what their questions are. This section of the Sermon on the Mount on divorce, 600 cards. Half the kids wanted to understand what this is all about. Why? Two things. First, this whole lust thing. I mean, telling a teenager not to lust is like telling a fire not to give off heat. Wouldn't you agree? 
So all teens in the room, sexuality is normal, lust is, it comes with it, okay? You can be a Christian in lust. We'll, we'll explain why in a minute. But they, but they were really upset about all of that. The second thing, though, was the section on divorce. Many of them, as I suspect people in this room as well, coming out of divorce, in families of divorce, they thought what Jesus is doing is just thumping people who've been divorced or have gotten a divorce, and they felt just, they thought, I can't follow this. This is just beating up on me. It was a real, real problem for them. So here's what we need to do. The Sermon on the Mount in this section says, anyone who looks at a woman and lusts after her, that's a bad translation. It should say, in the Greek it does say, anyone who looks at a woman and wants to control her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The issue is not lust like passion. The issue is power like having control or coveting another human being. So now, here's, how many times did you hear the phrase, but I say to you? How many times? How many? Four. Good. Very good. You win. <laughs> All right. You heard it four times. The Sermon on the Mount always does this. Jesus goes, you've heard it said, and then, but I say to you, this whole other thing, you've heard it said, but I say to you, and every single time you get that, but I say to you, interruption, it means that what happened before doesn't count anymore, right? But what's coming next is what's really important. What Jesus is teaching is that men and women should not have control over one another, but walk shoulder to shoulder in mutuality with one another. And the whole Sermon on the Mount is about describing how human beings, as God intends, live in a shoulder-to-shoulder, -shoulder, mutually respectful way in service to the kingdom. Now, you got the section of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, but you've heard it said, if you divorce your wife, give her a certificate of divorce. You know what the, what, here's what these guys are doing. Remember, women at that time, if you weren't married... You are poor. If your husband walked out on you, you're poor. That hasn't changed. Okay? And so women at that time, the guys would just walk away from them. Well, the Jews said, that's no good. At least give them a certificate. And Jesus is saying, this certificate business doesn't work either. You can't just give them a certificate and I'm out of it. So this is a powerful, powerful teaching that the rules have changed. The rules have changed. The old ways of doing things, Jesus is saying, no longer good. Something new is on, on, on going to happen. The rules have changed. And the rules are about human beings living in mutuality, in mutual love and concern. Christians walking shoulder to shoulder in service to others. The rules have changed, brothers and sisters. I am delighted as, uh, as the director of Ira Faith Ministries and our organization to be working with the whole South Dakota Synod because the rules have changed about how we do and think about church. Business people in the room, you all know, if you did business the same way you did business 10 years ago, you wouldn't be doing business, would you? The rules have all changed. So much has changed about our church and about congregational life and what it means to be a Christian in our time. Now, I'm not here to say, well, throw it all out the window. Don't hear that. In fact, I'm here to ask you to reclaim something. When the rules have changed, then there's something we need to stand on. Repeat after me. All of Scripture says, and all of Lutheran teachings say, and all of the research says, that when the rules have changed, do the four keys. And you say, what's the four keys? Pull out this little insert, would you? <laughs> See, this is not a program, guys. I am not here and working with the congregation and with all of you to bring a new program. 
We were talking about a lifestyle, what it means to be a Christian lifestyle in a time of tremendous change and cultural change. And if you look at this sheet, on, the, on one side it says the four keys. It starts with caring conversation. Basically, the case we made yesterday and the work we did at the conference yesterday was to say, if you forget everything else, Christians in a time of change, when the rules have changed, Christians should do these four things. I won't make the whole case for you now. You'd have to come to the conference yesterday. The first one is caring conversation. Simply taking time to build hospitality and relationship with other people, especially people who are feeling thumped. If people feel that Christian congregations are the place where we thump on divorced people, we draw circles of judgment around ourselves and, and judge everybody else, that's the old rule. The new rule, the ruling of Jesus, the words of Jesus are say, this, the kingdom of God is about hospitality for people, no matter how broken, no matter how different, no matter how uh, messed up their lives may be. That's what caring conversation really is. The second key is devotions. Taking time to do daily devotions in our own lives. And on this little Taking Faith Home piece, which you get every week, there are devotions on the other side. Now, here's the problem. All your parents, oh, man, I don't know how to do devotions. We didn't do them in our house. You know, I, I feel like I'm biblically illiterate. This is awkward. <laughs> it's okay. Do these little simple things. And we'll be teaching simple stuff. Eventually, it becomes really playful. The third key, though, is service. That in times of change, congregations and Christians over time in history have, who have made a difference are people who, and folks who do service. Wonderful example at the second service, an 18-year-old woman who's going to Nicaragua was prayed for, blessed, she's bilingual, she's going to work. Was it medical? Medical missionary kind of medical team. Incredible service. Here's the deal, guys. The research all shows that most congregations, most churches now, we Christians, we are viewed as judgmental and hypocritical by younger generations. That's how we're viewed. And so what they're saying is, I have none of this. But if Christians and Christian congregations say, can demonstrate, this is a place that makes a difference. This is a place that changes people's lives, that transforms others in our world through service. That is what the rules call for, places of change. And finally, the last key is rituals and traditions. And you may say, well, what's that all about? Well, I'll give you an example. You know, in your congregation, you do a blessing of the driver's license, don't you? When teenagers get their driver's license, do you do that? I, th I think you do. So you bring maybe your teens up here. I mean, think about it. You tell a teenager you can drive 70 miles an hour. You don't think that's worth a prayer? <laughs> Two tons of steel down the highway, and you're not going to pray for this? Okay. So you bring your teenagers here. You pray for them. I suspect you probably let everybody get out of the parking lot first before you let the kids go. One last thing, I think, on that ritual, it's a powerful ritual. It's a big, huge thing in the lives of teenagers. Why? Because it's freedom. It's Mel Gibson time. All right? Everybody gets to be free. I got wheels. All right. Last thing you ought to do about that little ritual, give them a WWJD bracelet. Remember, remember those old WWJD bracelets? What did that stand for? What would Jesus do? Walk! All the teenagers in the room are saying, I like this guy, but I don't think that was very funny. <laughs> All right. The other ritual, I want to teach you one today. How easy it is for these four keys to begin to shape us and change us. I want to teach you this one today. Uh, one, one day a week, I watch my two-and-a-half-year-old grandson. And uh, it's a great delight. We play all day, and then I nap. And... Uh, and I greet him every time the same way when I go over to the house to get him. I say, James Malcolm Hill, child of God, I am so grateful to see you. Now my son says, Dad, that is really corny. But don't ever stop doing it. Think about it. Isn't that what we want our kids to know? 
That's a whole theology or philosophy of life. We're children of God, and life is about an attitude of gratitude. So, you do it with your grandchildren, you do it with your family members, you do it with everybody. When you get up in the morning, you see your family members or your friends, you look at them and say their name and then say, child of God, I'm so grateful to see you. We're going to practice. I want you to turn to your neighbor. Say their name. And then say, child of God, I am so grateful to see you. And some of you did that with a little more sincerity than others. <laughs> so practice. It changes your frame. It changes your frame. That's the new rules. The new rules of faith in this culture, in this time, say we're children of God and we're living lives of attitude of gratitude. I'll give you one last little example so you can start a ritual in your life that's really significant. How many of you, when you get, when you, somebody greets you, what do you usually say? I say, how you doing? Fine. Even if you're not. Okay. I suggest you start doing this. How you doing? Ask me that. Well, I'm grateful. I am grateful. I'm grateful. That changes everything. People look at you and say, you're grateful. What's that about? I get on an airplane. A flight attendant says, well, how you doing, sir? Welcome aboard. How you doing? I say, I'm grateful. More often than not, they say, well, isn't that the case? You see, we need to frame our lives in a time when Christianity is not the big dominant dog in the culture anymore. We need to say in our daily life, in simple little rituals and language, that there is more than me and you in this world. It's about this too. God's a player in my life, and God, because God's a player in my life, we're going to have a relationship of mutuality and respect. So, I will now ask you, how you guys doing? You said fine. What is wrong with you? Are you listening? <laughs> I'll try that one more time. How are you guys doing? Amen.